Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. Hey there. Welcome back to another episode of my podcast, Flavors Unknown. And my guest today is Ted Lee, who grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. And when you talk to Ted, he's describing himself as working on a lot of food stuff. That's funny. But he's obviously very well known with his brother, Matt. The two of them form the Lee brothers as cookbook authors. And they just published their new book called Hotbox about the catering business. I am your host, Emmanuel LaRoche. Thank you for tuning in today. If you are new to the show, I have been in the food industry for more than 20 years, both in Europe and in the US. And every other week, I interview trending chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders to discover their secrets behind the scenes, to understand their creative process, identify new exciting locations around the country, and find out which new flavors those chefs are experimenting with. The website is flavorsunknown.com. Last week, my guest was Chef Brother Luck from 4 by Luck in Colorado Springs. And you can find the show notes on the episode webpage on flavorsunknown.com. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast as you do not want to miss the future great episodes that are going to come. You can follow us as well on social media, on Instagram and Facebook at Flavors Unknown. Today is really a great episode with Ted Lee, and I am inviting you to do something we never done before, to discover the secrets behind the scene of writing a cookbook with a true expert because him and his brother, Matt, have written a lot of different cookbooks, and they even have a cookbook writing boot camp in Charleston. Hi, Ted. Thank you very much for uh, joining us, and uh, thank you very much for being a guest on Flavors Unknown. I'm happy to be here, Emmanuel. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're welcome. So I'm very excited to uh, to have you. We all know that you and your brother wrote several books, Southern Cookbook, yes. The Charleston Kitchen, Simple Fresh Southern, and recently The Hot Box. Yes. Uh, you have a company called Boiled Peanut Catalogs in Charleston. Yes, the Lee Brothers Boiled Peanuts Catalog in Charleston, South Carolina. You have done a TV show as well that was called Southern Uncovered. So we are going to talk a little bit about all those elements and the facets, um, you know, of you being a food journalist, an author, sure. an entrepreneur. But I'm curious, how would you describe yourself? That's a great question. <laughs> you know, there was a, it's funny, a very young person who was in college introduced me to a friend of his as, this is Ted, he does random things in food. And <laughs> I was so pissed off when he said that, you know, this was like maybe 10 years ago. But, you know, the more 10 years ago, I would have described myself as a cookbook author mm -hmm. that, because that's what I did mostly. Now, as you mentioned, I did a recent book with my brother that's a narrative nonfiction book about the catering industry called Hotbox. So I'm Ted Lee. I do random things in food. <laughs> <laughs> you have to you have to create a, an elevator speech, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I, I think, you know, that is it, it is interesting in, in sort of saying, like, what are you? You know, it was always difficult as a cookbook author because people always assume that you have a restaurant. But I don't have a restaurant and I wasn't trained in restaurants. The highest position I ever achieved in a restaurant was in my uncle's restaurant as a busboy. But I do have a very developed kitchen practice where, you know, my brother and I, we were doing recipe development and writing for the New York Times, for Martha Stewart Living, for Food and Wine for a, a long, you know, many years. We don't have that restaurant experience. So, you know, the question, I'm just a passionate home cook who's managed to parlay that with my brother, with this partnership into a lot of different areas of, of the food business. And, and I think it's exciting these days that, that there are more and more venues where that 
kind of intelligence is is valued. So what got you into writing cookbooks with you and your brother? Well, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the the boiled peanuts catalog, and, and that's really where it all started. I mean, even before we started selling boiled peanuts by mail order, it really started because we grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. What's interesting, my brother was born in D.C. when my father was in his armed service in, in D.C. in the hospital there. And my brother was born there. And They later moved to New York City when he was doing his residency, and he's a doctor. And I was born in New York City. We lived in New York City until 1979. So when I so was your brother, eight, but you're not twins, correct? Because a lot of people correct, believe that correct. you're twins, but you're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not. We do look a lot alike. We have sort of yeah. the same balding pattern, and uh, you know, we look a lot alike, but we're not twins. He's two years older than I am. The main thing is like. When we were young, when I was maybe eight and he was 10, it was 1979, my parents moved from New York City to Charleston, South Carolina. And I would say we grew up in Charleston. That's really where most of our inspiration comes from. And I think it all goes back to being a young kid, moving to a place that you don't know very well, and sort of processing the differences between those places through food, which was sort of the most compelling thing about, and the thing that you can latch on to, right? Because you can taste it. We'd never had fresh shrimp before. We'd never had fresh blue crab. We'd n I'd never eaten an oyster before I landed in Charleston. And all my friends, you know, my new friends in Charleston, we were only eight years old. They already knew how to shuck an oyster, right? And, you know, that was, so there was all this learning that Matt and I had to do that was related to food. And, you know, at, you're a kid at that age, you don't perceive it as a culinary experience. You perceive it as sport. It's just sport. You learn how to tie a drop line and throw it off a dock and catch a blue crab. And it, you don't think of it as, you know, Alice Waters. You have this fresh local experience. You think of it as it's fun. But, you know, a lot of It's kids move, uh, move around with their parents and and it doesn't mean that even if they love the food from, you know, the place that they grew up, you know, with, it's, that they are going to write cookbooks about it. So what made, yeah. made you, you know, passionate about this so much that you wanted to write about well, it? Well, that's, yeah, I mean, I'm going way back. I mean, I think there was various things that sort of had us sort of develop this interest and orientation toward food. And one was that, so my mother, she didn't find a job in Charleston at the level where she was in New York. So she ended up commuting to New York during the week when I was in high school. And so that sort of got my brother and me into the food life of the family where we're going to, you know, my dad's putting dinner on the table and we're helping him prepare the food and shop for food. And so we were his prep cooks. And then I also had a very influential uncle in my life, a guy named John Maxwell, still alive, living in Portugal. And he, at the time, was a restaurateur in Toronto. And when we were in high school, we would go visit him in Toronto, and we would just do whatever he needed us to do in the restaurant. And he was really had an amazing palate so far ahead of his time. You know, he was custom raising cattle in Ontario. To, you know, to serve uh, beef carpaccio. He was doing Highland cattle. And so I would have to go to the abattoir where he, you know, he was custom raising the cattle. He was custom cutting it. You know, all these kinds of things all add up. And then when we were graduated from college, we were both moved to New York. I got a degree in English. So I thought I was going to be a fiction writer. I did a creative thesis. My brother got a degree in art history. He thought he was going to enter the auction houses world, you know, the art market kind of thing. And we were just so homesick in New York. We started boiling peanuts and they tasted so good, you know, and we, could, we, f we found them at the Hunts Point Terminal Market in the Bronx, the raw peanuts that you need. And we boiled them up in our apartment on Ludlow Street on the Lower East Side. This was in 1993 or 94. And so then we were like, they're so good. We should sell these. Like, why doesn't New York have boiled peanuts? They, there's a, you can get everything else in New York. Why not boiled peanuts? And so that's when we started knocking on doors of rest, the Southern restaurants in New York at the time and saying, you know, would you like to carry these? We'd love to s sell them to you. 
And most of those restaurants didn't know what they were, even though they were Southern restaurants. And so we kind of did a switch and we, we moved back to Charleston, started the mail order business. And we realized the business had been written up in the Times by then. We realized at that time that we needed to find the people who already knew what they were, but didn't, couldn't get them because they were like us. They were expatriate Southerners who'd landed in Los Angeles or Anchorage or wherever, and they couldn't get them. And so we would be their hookup. So we moved back to Charleston, started that business. And the, the where it switched when we started writing was when a customer of the catalog, our mail order catalog, which by then was boiled peanuts and other Southern staples like grits, stone ground grits, fig preserves, all these things that are, you know, that, are, that at that time were very difficult to source if you didn't have a mail order source for them. One of our customers was an editor at Travel and Leisure magazine. And she reached out and said, would you like to write a story about, you know, road tripping around your part of the South looking for products for your catalog? And we said, yeah. <laughs> and so that story came out in 1999. And after that, there weren't many food writers at that time covering the Southeast. And so we were very fortunate in that we had this story that we did in Travel and Leisure and other places started calling us and saying, oh, we saw that story. Food and Wine called and said, we, we want to see, you know, another story like that, but, you know, cover a different part of the South. So we ended up traveling around the South a lot on other magazines and newspapers dime and learning more. I mean, Emmanuel, we grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. It's a very particular region of the South. So we didn't know a lot about Eastern Kentucky or the panhandle of Florida. And so then, you know, this other phase of our lives, it was, you know, magazines paying us to go to different regions of the South that we didn't know to write about them. And it was so exciting. We learned so much. Because remember, I, Matt and I, we don't have a Southern grandmother. We grew up in Charleston. But neither of our parents grew up there. So we had to learn everything about Southern food from somebody else's mother or grandmother. <laughs> and then you published after that, then the Southern Cookbook. That was your first one, correct? Yeah, that was the first one. And that really metabolized what, you know, the previous, you know, three, four or five years traveling around the South. You know, the perspective of that was... It was the Lee Brothers Southern Cookbook. And the subtitle was Stories and Recipes for Southerners and would-be Southerners. The would-be Southerners sort of being a self-reflection on ourselves because, you know, we weren't born there. So we had to sort of say, like, if you didn't grow up in the South, you can still cook great Southern food. Here's, you know, we're the perfect people to tell you how because we had to learn it all from other people. You know, from yeah. Southerners. I mean, so. those books are great. I have, I have the four of them. So it's, it's, oh, it's really cool. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. You know, we're really proud of them. <laughs> you should be. Them. You should be. So what's the recipe for a successful cookbook? And because there's so many cookbooks out there and yeah. there's, uh, you know, is it like, you know, should we go with a recipe cookbook? Is it like an art, you know, that you are more looking yeah. at pictures? You know, there's so many genre of cookbooks, but what's right. the recipe for a successful one? Well, here's the thing. I think it all depends on the author. And I think the last 20 years in cookbook publishing has all sort of redounded to that it matters like who it all starts the genesis is all with the author we know who who is the person behind the book i think you especially in the past five six years you've seen lots of books that come from a very particular personality and they're going to show you for example von diaz's book she's someone who sort of like me, was born in one place and grew up in another. She was born in Puerto Rico and grew up in Atlanta. And her perspective is all about how her kitchen practice developed between these two cultures, right? And similarly, Eddie Hernandez's book, Turnip Greens and Tortillas, he grew up in Mexico, ended up living his professional life, most of his adult life in Georgia, so that's all about his, you know, these two cultures, Mexico and the South. And I think the most exciting books 
that are being done today are the most personal book, personal books. The ones that really like are from an accomplished cook who's telling you about how who they became resulted in the food they serve and why people love it. Which is not to say there aren't beautiful technique books out there. You know, there are some people who are doing amazing bread books, who are doing amazing, you know, single subject books that are less about like, this is where I'm from, this is my story. And so there can be, all, the great thing about cookbooks is there can be all kinds of, and as long as they are of quality, the recipes work, they're tested, they will find an audience. Because there are plenty of people who are wanting to go to the library or to the bookstore to get a book that shows them how to make candy or pasta. You know, I don't think there's to say, is there a recipe? I just think it has to have a point of view. First of all, it has to have a cohesive point of view, whether it's a very personal story or whether it's a primer on how to make handmade pasta. It has to have a very specific point of view. But beyond that, the recipes have to work. If they don't work, it's just dead in the water. And that's something we learned when we did our first book. We had a really great editor on our first book who said, you have to invest the money in independent testing. You know, it's hard when it costs, you know, on, it might cost $100 a recipe to test mm, Wow! Yeah. to send to an independent tester. I mean, hopefully less if you do a batch and, and, and they're good on economizing on ingredients. But that money pays off because it stays on the shelves. And that's what, that's what we've learned. We learned that with our first book and our, we've continued the pro, through the process. But do you think that uh, nowadays with, you know, digital and the Amazon and people listening to, uh, you know, books, you know, in the car and about, you know, like self-publishing or people that want to have more, um, I would say, videos. Do you think that the world of the cookbook and the way that you have structured the cookbooks when you started has dramatically changed and now that uh, the audience, you know, requires something different? That's a really great question. I think that the audience has become accustomed to such a high quality book. For example, I think it's a really rare book nowadays that does not have beautiful food photography. And, you know, the, our first book had almost no photographs compared to the number of recipes in it. There was 225 recipes and there were 32 pages of photo inserts. There, that's rare. I mean, it's rare you find a book that doesn't have photographs. But then again, if you do find a book without photographs, it's usually because that, that style of just doing illustrations is very specific to that restaurant or that author, where it might be in the spirit of the restaurant not to do, you know, the food porny photographs. But as far as how things are changing, it's really exciting time because I think more and more people are looking to self-publish. And I am more familiar with the not self-publishing route, the route of finding a national publisher, getting, you know, multiple publishers interested in a cookbook, in the idea, having an auction and then selling to the one that you, you know, the editor that you met with and had a great relationship with. But that's not what everyone, you know, not everyone has to do that. You know, there are examples of fantastic self-published cookbooks that are you know, in general, self-publishing, if you have a following and if you have an audience and you can afford to do this distribution yourself and the printing yourself, you can make a wonderful sort of cookbook let that you can sell out of your restaurant. It's, you know, it especially works if you have a retail presence, whether you're a bakery or a restaurant, you can produce a beautiful cookbook of your, you know, a little sort of cookbook lit of 20 of your best recipes and you can sell it out of your restaurant and the, you know, the cost that you pay per book is so minimal and you can charge, you know, $16 for it because these are your best 20 recipes. It's the price of a cocktail. Can you make money of, um, you know, publishing a book? Uh, Self-publishing? Probably both. Self-publishing or, or, or oh right gosh. Here. Well, <laughs> I think you can make money. Here's the thing is that usually the book sort of breaks even. But it, it serves every other aspect of your business. 
So for example, if you're a restaurant, you're probably going to make money because you can sell that book out of your restaurant every night. You are your own retail space. So that especially is a way to sell through. Publishers take a bet. You know, they, they, I, I once had an editor tell me at a very sort of vulnerable moment, we'd both been drinking and she was like, Ted, you know what? I have to publish nine books a season, but I only really have time for two. And there's probably only two that are going to be successful. And, you know, that was sobering, right? Except for the fact that, you know, there's a lot of great cookbooks that are out there that I love that probably have never earned back their advances, but that's fine because they're in the world and we love them and own them. And, you know, my brother and I, we developed a curriculum called Cookbook Bootcamp. Yeah, I wanted to ask you the question. Yeah. What, yeah, it's what like is a, that? It's like a, it's like a two-day curriculum. I mean, you know, we always had people coming to us at food festivals, chefs coming to us at food festivals saying, hey, man, I want to do a cookbook. Let me pick your brain. And, you know, it takes more of a commitment than that. It really has to, you, you know, if you want to write a cookbook, you have to sit down for two days at least, and think about what is your idea? How are you going to create the time to do this? Do you even know what's involved in getting a proposal together? Because theoretically, it's simple. A proposal can be 30 or 40 pages. It doesn't have to be more than 12 recipes, but it has to be a true and real presentation of who you are and what you want the book to be. And that takes time. And the thing is, you know, you can get any number of people to help you as collaborators, you know, it can take a village. Most cookbooks take a village to produce. I don't do the photography for my own books. I do the writing, but I don't do the photography or the prop styling or any of that stuff. And a lot of people can get someone, a collaborator, if they're not writers, they can get a writer to help them. And that's money well spent because for a busy chef, that time is their most important commodity. And, you know, there are amazing collaborators in the field who do that kind of work. Jamie Feldmar. Oh my gosh, I'm forgetting has JJ Good, who do that work of sitting down with a chef and sort of capturing their voice on the page. And for a busy chef, that may be the difference between doing the book or not doing the book. So what's the structure of the, the two days of your book camp? So we we it's it's basically six seminars over two days. And it's three in each day, and they're two-hour seminars. And the first one is finding your voice, you know. And it's basically goes to the heart of, are you going to be writing this? Or are you going to be bringing on a collaborator? We take, we take them through writing exercises just to get them feeling like, oh, you know, because some of them are just like, I can't do this. This is impossible. But they can usually talk about it very articulately. And so you can say, like, this is exactly the case where you should be finding a collaborator. The second one is defining your kitchen vision. Like, what is your kitchen? Vi what, is, what is your point of view? Because if we go around the room, there's six chefs, and pretty much all of them, you say, what's your cooking about? Like, how would you describe your cooking? And they'll say, well, it's, you know, it's American, fresh, seasonal, local. And, you know, when the sixth person has said American, fresh, seasonal, local, you realize, you know what, you have to, you really have to iron down on what is it that you're bringing to the food culture today that's distinct? Is it the character of your restaurant? It could be. Maybe you're designing the book around your restaurant. It's the restaurant book, like the Cafe Boulou cookbook. But maybe it's not, you know, maybe, maybe it's more like Andrea Rusing's book, Cooking in the Moment. You know, she has a very successful restaurant in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, but her first book was all about cooking as a sort of improvisatory act, you know, cooking in the moment, like just having a kitchen practice that opens itself up to what you find at the market on a given day and teaching home cooks how to adopt that kind of improvisational ethos. So it's it just, you know, it's very specific to each individual student in the workshop, but they all benefit from hearing other people struggle through, you know, what it is about them and their kitchen practice that is important and needs to be out there in the world in the form of a book. And does it need to be a book? Maybe it would be better served as something else. We've had a lot of people come to Cookbook Bootcamp 
And a lot of chefs feel the compulsion or writers to do a book, especially for some chefs, you know, what they take away from it is like, oh no, this is not the right time to do a book. I'm too, I'm young. You know, I don't own my restaurant a hundred percent. Cause that's another question is like, do you own the restaurant or are you going to be working on your restaurant's cookbook? And then you might not even, you know, the restaurant might not even be there. You wouldn't want to do work on a cookbook that you didn't own a hundred percent. Or if you didn't own it a hundred percent, you'd want to work out a deal. So the, the work you did on it was remunerated by the, by the house, by the ownership. What's the third step of the, of the first day then? Keeping your material fresh. Because we found, especially in the first few boot camps we did, that people were coming to us and they didn't know what was out there. And so we did a whole separate session on how you keep abreast of what is in the marketplace. Because I do think, regardless of what the perspective is, the book has to bring something that's not already out there. Of course, of course. So day two. Day, day two is more, is more practical right? Day two is session number four is developing a test kitchen practice. Because a lot of uh, chefs think, well, I'm just going to test my recipes, you know, in the off hours after service, you know. And that's not actually if you're writing a book for home cooks, people with kitchens that aren't professional kitchens, you have to test your recipes in a kitchen that's not a professional kitchen. So you can't you can't go into the walk in and pull a bunch of parsley from the box of parsley because that's not the, that's not the way home cooks buy parsley. If you're a chef and you're developing a cook a cookbook for home cooks, you have to buy the parsley yourself. And you have to sift through the crap that's at the grocery store and have to contend with all that because and you have to do the dishes yourself because otherwise you don't know what your readers you don't know the experience that your reader is going through. So if you're a chef and you, you know, you create 10 different dirty dishes in the context of doing a recipe, there's nobody at home who's going to do that. Right. So you, you have to sort of replicate the experience of your reader. Now here's the, here's the caveat to that as a chef, if you can afford it, you don't have to do that. You can have someone else do that work of translating your recipes to the home cook, the home kitchen. And there are great, people who do that work, you know, who do that collaborative work. In Charleston, we have Marion Sullivan, who, who does that work for Sean Brock's books. And she's an ace. And that's what she does. You know, she takes a restaurant chef's recipes that are scaled for a la minute cooking, and she makes them work for, you know, 12 people in a home kitchen in St. Louis, Missouri. I don't think that people realize that. Yeah, that's great. That's interesting. Yeah, there's a lot that you, you have to, you know, you as a chef, you have to transform your practice, which works in your restaurant, to a home cook if that's what you're doing. I mean, maybe there are some chefs who write cookbooks for other professional chefs. They don't have to do that work, but it's a more limited market if you're just writing your book for professional chefs. You know, you won't, that book won't be carried in most independent bookstores because most independent bookstores don't serve the professional community. You know, you'll be selling your book in cooking schools. So what's the two last steps of day two? The fifth seminar is all about how are you going to tell your story in visuals, right? Like what, besides the text, right? We worked on day one on the text. Like, are you going to be writing it? How are you going to refine what you're, you know, what language are you going to use to tell your story? Here we're talking about visuals. Are there going to be photos in the book? There might not need to be. You know, we had Paul Farabach, who has Big Jones Restaurant in Chicago. It's a fabulous Southern restaurant in Chicago. And he has no food porn. You know, he has no, no food shots in his book because it wasn't in the spirit of the restaurant. And it wasn't in his, it, it just wasn't something that he needed, he felt, in, in the book. And it's a fantastic book, the Big Jones book. But there are people who do want that. And for those who do, you know, we talk about all the ways there are to tell the story. Our first book had, as I mentioned, 32 photographs. So it was four eight page inserts of food porn photographs, you know, the dish shots. And 
that's one way to do it. You know, very few photographs and more text. I don't think it's as common as it used to be. Our second book had very tight, almost every page had a full color food photograph opposite the recipe. Recipe photo, recipe photo, recipe photo. And then there were also those lifestyle shots of you know, parties and entertaining. Our third book, the Lee Brothers Charleston Kitchen, had so many different varieties of photos. There were archival photos because it was the Charleston Kitchen. We were going deep on the town we grew up in. You know, this is our tribute to the town that made us cookbook author. So there were portraits, like contemporary portraits that we commissioned of people who are really important in our cooking lives and our story. There were archival photos of the 1930s in Charleston. There was a layer of photos that of just snapshots that Matt and I had taken around, you know, going around town and taking pictures of flowers and, and figs on trees and loquats and things like that. And there were maps, illustrated maps, because there were so many recipes that could be tied to a, an actual house in Charleston or a specific restaurant. You know, there was like a driving tour. So that's the fifth one is like, how do you envision your book? Throughout, we always say like, definitely have books that you look to as, as ones that you want to emulate because they, you know, those are the ones with the, the rhythm of the photos. The last one is all about marketing and publicity. It's a little bit cart before the horse, but honestly, so many people who've gone on to publish from our boot camps say, oh my gosh, that was the most important thing. That was the most important one because we do go through, part of this is that we've had every experience that you can ever have in publishing from the highest highs, like winning, we, you know, our first book won Best American and Cookbook of the Year from the James Beard Foundation. So that was like the highest of the highs. And we have experienced the lowest of the lows where, you know, you just feel like you're, being crushed and nobody's paying attention to you and here you've you've spent so much so many years putting out this book and publisher sent the book to the all the editors and you're calling the editors you know these people and you're saying did you get my book and they're like yeah no I didn't get your book where's your book? What, you know what are you up to and you're like you got to be kidding me so we just set people up to succeed in the context of marketing and publicity which is you know it's 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 definitely, that's the one thing certainly that's changed since Matt and I started publishing cookbooks is that, you know, the ways in which you market your book, the ways in which you get the word out have exploded exponentially, which makes it awesome in a lot of ways because there are more avenues to promote your book than ever before. But it makes for, you know, it means the, the amount of work that you spend doing that is like 10 times more. So how many um, of those boot camps do you do per year? We do usually one or two. It depends. We sort of open, we open enrollment sort of in late summer, early September, and then we just see how many, how many people sign up. So, you know, sometimes we do two. There was one year where we did four, but we generally do them in January and June because we find that that's when chefs sort of have time to take off. Because they do, you know, it's two, it's two days. It's Monday and a Tuesday. You know, we, they arrive in Charleston on Sunday and then it's Monday and Tuesday and it's two full days and there's not much yeah, that's, downtime. That's, it's a, lot like for, full that's on, a lot for them too. Full on, for them to take off that time and they're always on, on lunch break, they're always calling in and making sure, sure. They're, you know, that everything's okay. Yeah. Checking with their restaurants, yeah. Let's talk about uh, your the city that you grew up in Charleston. Sure. So it's still one of the prime culinary destination in the country. I've yes. been there many times. I love the place and I'm jealous every time I look at the weather <laughs> in New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially the, at the it was moment. 70 degrees today. <laughs> don't don't say 70 anything. degrees there. My brother, <laughs> okay. you know, so <laughs> I'm the brother who lives in Brooklyn. My brother lives in Charleston full time. I married an artist who's based in Brooklyn. So I'm here most of the time and I'm there like one week a month. And it's, you know, it's the best of both worlds, but I happen to be in Brooklyn today. Oh, you're in Brooklyn. Okay. So why do you think Charleston became this mecca of like the good, I mean, the place for like great food, you know, in, in the U.S.? 
You know, I think it's a number of forces, but I think it all has to do with the history. Remember, we're a coastal community, so you already have all the fish, fin fish, shellfish. You have so much there. And then you have the history of during the Atlantic slave trade, you have all this rice cultivation. You know, people refer to the Carolina rice kitchen. You have enslaved West Africans building with their knowledge and their labor a rice growing region that established the economy of the coastal South for a long time. And not only that, red field peas bringing okra. The Atlantic slave trade is, you know, it's responsible for a lot of the ingredients we've come to know and love. And also Charleston is a port city. So spices, spices were a big part of, of the cooking, you know, from the 19th century onward. And it was, you know, it's just all these factors. The fact that there is such fertile land in proximity to this port city, amazing, you know, tomato growing region. Mount Pleasant, South Carolina was a huge asparagus growing region. Pretty much everything grows there. We have citrus. You know, there's a street downtown in downtown Charleston called Orange Street. And it's called Orange Street because it was an orange grove. Like that block of the city at one time was an orange grove. There's a lot of these influences coming in. It's very much a Creole, lots of influences coming together. And at the same time, there are, you know, there are cookbooks, 19th century and 20th century cookbooks that codified, you know, how people were cooking. I mean, Matt and I always maintain that everyone cooks differently from house to house in the South. And so there are as many, there could be as many cookbooks as there are Southern kitchens. So we're not necessarily big on the rules. You know, people are always saying, you know, you put what in your gumbo? And there is this impression that Southern food is very rigid and that it's about being correct. We love to make fun of that. We love that idea because there are, you, there are so many times when I myself, you know, being this guy who grew up, you know, born in New York, raised in Charleston, and someone will say what they did to shrimp and grits. And I'm like, how could you murder that? What? Black <laughs> truffles and grits? But, you know, it, that's what makes it fun. You know, it's always evolving. So soul food, low country, gula. So can you explain to me, a French guy here, even you have been there and I read about it, but what's the difference between them? It's a great question. I would say in, there's a lot in common between the cuisines you mentioned, Gullah Geechee, cooking, low country cooking, and soul food. I would say they all have their origins in the migration of enslaved Africans to North America. That's the origin of those things. And you can see in a dish that's sort of a classic low country dish like red rice, you can see the sort of connections to the West African jollof rice. And, you know, there are lots of examples of that. And it's a huge, you know, it's a huge influence. I would say that what's important is, is to get away from defining them or defining them as sort of oppositional, but finding the proximities and especially finding a chef who can guide you through that, through their personal experience, either through a book or by meeting them. You know, like I, now you mentioned Gullah Geechee, one of the you know, foremost young practitioners of Gullah Geechee cooking in the low country right now is a chef named BJ Dennis. And he just did an event on Johns Island, South Carolina, just last weekend, where he cooked in a pit, a whole cow. Wow. Slow cooked, right? You know, on a property out on the sea islands. And you can, you know, you can just buy a ticket to that event. And really get an empirical firsthand experience with someone whose family has been in this area for generations. And that's, you know, the magic of the low country is how the traditions survive to the day and, and the chefs who are practicing know a lot about their ancestors and they're very 
proud and, you know, excited to share that knowledge. And so, you know, finding a great chef who's working in the community and can really function as an education in a whole cuisine. And and today it seems that, you know, with this old movement of the Southern revival, that's, you know, it seems that the history is continuing, that you were talking about the influence and impact of uh, the food that brought by the slaves coming from West Africa to the region. And nowadays we see a lot of pockets of uh, ethnic groups throughout the South. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking on throughout Charleston. The South. I'm, yeah, I'm talking about a broader space here, but uh, like Vietnamese community in um, sure. New Orleans or, you know, sure. Sicilian community in Memphis and so on. So it right. seems that that history is continuing. And I think it's fascinating when you see the chefs that are both leveraging the local ingredients that have been rediscovered and at the same time combining this with, uh, you know, spices of herbs and and so on that they found on, you know, the ethnic markets. Uh, So what do you think about this? Southern food has always been an evolution and that continues to this day. And that's one of the most exciting things about where we are right now. I think that the practitioners today are the practitioners, whether they're chefs, whether they're scholars, they're kind of more in tune with telling stories about, you know, themselves and their ancestors, where they've come from, where they're going, and really situating their own kitchen practice between the past and the present and the future. There's just, you know, numerous, numerous examples. And I think it really has, since cooking has become more culture in this country, in the last 20 years, I think just those, the cultural stories that people are telling nowadays are really illuminating and exciting. I feel like everyone's kitchen practice is its own sort of, it's its own story. And, you know, if you love the food, you can learn a lot from that person. And that's why I think that, you know, that I I mentioned at the early part of our conversation about how cookbooks seem to be going in a more personal direction. And I think that's what it's about. It's about, you know, a chef wanting to honor the stories of their descendants that made them who they are, you know, and also telling the story about where, what they're exposed to now, where that's pushing them in the future. So talking about cookbook, I have in front of me here, your latest one, the hot box, inside catering, the food world's richest business. So that you published in 2019. What made you decide to write a book about catering? So that was the thing is that Matt and I, we'd done three cookbooks that we felt really sort of metabolized our whole story about how we got into food and cooking from this smallish town on, on the East Coast we're supposed to turn in another cookbook. We had three books on the contract and they said, well, you know, do a grilling book or do a vegetable book. And we were like, you know, that's not really how we do books because for us, it has to be a story. It has to be organic. It has to come from who we are. We're not just going to like come up with a hundred grill recipes to, to make a book. Around the same time, we were coming to the conclusion that we weren't going to slice the South, our own part of the Southern pie thinner we also had the chance encounter with an incredible team of catering chefs in the context of a dinner at the Beard House where this executive chef of a cater- of high-end caterer in Manhattan called Sonia and Castle, he and his two deputies were brought in by a Southern chef from a, the Atlanta restaurant Miller Union, Stephen Satterfield. They were helping him in the James Beard House kitchen, which is, a, as, as you probably know. It's very tiny. There. Yeah, I've been there several times. It's, yeah. it's very small. It has commercial equipment. It's very hot. You know, this was 10 years ago. These chefs walked in that kitchen having never cooked with Stephen before. They'd never cooked in that kitchen. And they walked in there at, you know, 5 p.m. for a 6.30 or 7 o'clock hors d'oeuvre <laughs> serve out. Wow. And they just, they just were miracle workers. They just stepped in. They basically did all the line cooking so that Stephen and his sous chef could expedite. And, you know, they ran out of grill space on the griddle. So they just, there were two seared courses back to back. So they just 
slapped sheet pans down on burners and just made oh, candles. Wow. Oh, wow. And so they worked in a way that was very intuitive. It was very, there wasn't a lot of words exchanged. They didn't have any statement hair or statement frames. They didn't have any tattoos. They didn't have their names on their jackets. They were like culinary special ops, you know, special ops forces. And so afterwards, we went out for beers with them afterwards and we said, oh my gosh, you guys are amazing. You, you crushed that. It's like 75 people, five courses. And they said, so that's nothing. Yeah, that's be- <laughs> that's, we don't sweat until there's 750 people. <laughs> you know, they said a small party for us is 350. Yeah. So we said, but, but what about that kitchen with the terrible, you know, so small and there's no, and they said, that kitchen was amazing. There was <laughs> running water. There was gas, a gas hookup. There was ventilation. There was air conditioning. They said, usually every venue we work, there is no kitchen. We build the kitchen. You know, they come in at three o'clock, they build the kitchen, they serve out the gala for 1300 people, and then they have to be out by midnight. And they do it again the next day, (laughs) right? And do it again the next day. Exactly, exactly, exactly. exactly. It's totally different place the next day. So we said, you know, we, we had written these stories for the New York Times Magazine in the mid 2000s about just these kinds of workers in the food industry who nobody who are, are often overlooked. Like we wrote about, you know, a flavoring salesman. We wrote about a cake mover, you know, the person who moves the cake from the, the baker's studio to the venue. But we'd never really written about caterers. And so we said, hey, can we follow you guys? And they said, well, Come and work with us. <laughs> That's exactly what they said. There's no room for someone to follow us. If yeah. you're going to work for us, work for us. Oh, and wow. so that's what we did. We did that for three and a half years. And that's what the book was really about. You, is You worked three and a half years with them? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, it wasn't the thing about catering is everyone, which is one of many things we learned is there's most everyone in the kitchen, in kitchens, in catering kitchens is sort of working for a lot of different people. And so we could, we could keep all our other stuff going, you know, we could work for like two weeks at a time and then drop out for two months and then do two weeks on. And, you know, we'd always be sent emails from our booker being like, can you work this party? Can you work this party? And then you'd say, no, no, no. You know, I, I, you'd say, I would usually say I won't be available for another two weeks, but I'll be back, you know. So how is it different to be a, to be a chef at a catering business compared to at a restaurant? It's so different. I mean, the main thing is, Emmanuel, very rarely are you cooking things to order. So if if we were doing a gala, you know, with 600 people, beef filet, tenderloin, or lamb chops, those proteins would be seared in a deep fryer the day before. And then just to get the color on them and then peeled down in the walk-in and then it would be moved to the venue in a transport cabinet. And then once it's on site, it's turned into a hot box. All the full foods pulled from it and transformed using sterno and sheet pans into a warming oven. And so it's a completely different practice than what restaurant chefs are used to in the sense that it's, and, and the other thing that's, you know, it's all, for most plated dinners, it's simultaneous service. So you're really building a kitchen that's meant to serve out the first course, the second course, and the third course, all the same plate within 15 minutes. Instead of having the bell curve that a restaurant has over the course of the evening, you know, where the orders come in, you know, and it's really busy at certain times and that comes down, like this is just a spike. So can you give us an example of how insane, you know, those kind of like the pressure these cooks are under during events? And maybe you have probably your own examples as well. When you guys, both of you, <laughs> you know, started working there. <laughs> yeah, well, for example, my brother, my brother made the mistake of the thing about the hot boxes, you know, it's the rolling aluminum cabinet full of food. Once you get on site and you transform it into the warming oven. The chef who's running that hot box has to know exactly when the serve out time is. So it's usually, you know, for the main course, it's usually 8.15 or 8.30. Maybe it's 8.45. 
my brother once closed the door on the hot box. And the thing is about the hot box is you have to keep it open, right? Your instinct is to close the door because you want to keep the heat inside. But if you close it all the way, you snuff out all the sternos. And so my brother closed the door <laughs> on, you know, you've got 300 portions of lamb chops in there. And he snuffed out all the sternos. And fortunately, the guy who was running it, he'd show my brother, you know, he'd, he'd ask my brother to move something around in there. And then my brother would shut it. And fortunately, it got caught because, you know, if, if those 300 portions are now 10 minutes behind in doneness, there's no recovery from that. I mean, there's, you're just going to be reserve, serving underdone food. There are rarely hugely epic fails. And that's because if there were more of them, then nobody would have business. You know, I mean, there's the, the reason why there are professionals in the industry is because they make sure things like that don't happen. But there are every chef has a story. The worst thing you can have happen is have a sprinkler go off. And that happens a lot, especially in places where the hot box gets too close to the sprinkler system, like in a low ceiling place with a sprinkler. There's a story about a, a chef who he caught a, an apartment, Park Avenue Apartments, on fire. What's amazing is he kept his job. That's what was so amazing is he caught a, a, an apartment on fire and he still had a job. <laughs> and I think he works in a country club in Westchester now. Everyone <laughs> has their horror stories. The one that was the best, my brother's horror story was he was pushing. You know how you have racks of glasses that come from the rental company? You have, and they're, they come in plastic racks. Well, my brother was pushing on a dolly a rack of glasses that had been filled with a parfait, oh, a boy. dessert parfait. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So there was probably six high. There's probably 50 in each rack. And he pushed it over an electrical cable and the electrical, it didn't, it didn't, it just stopped. And so the entire rack went sideways. Oh my gosh. And fortunately it just happened to be it was the NBA Legends brunch and so it that which is oh, 1400 people oh. at the Javits Center. There's so much food there that it happened not to be missed because it's a buffet event. Okay, okay. But if it had been a seated dinner, you just what can you do? There's no dessert. So why don't we ne we never hear about you know those you never chefs you, ne you know those people There's working in the theater. <laughs> I'm not talking about the failure. I'm talking about Oh, Those you're, amazing you're people about, that are there and they have the popularity, yeah. you know, do tend, you know, there's no visibility. Well, the thing. There's no visibility because they're working in special events catering. And the whole thing about special events, you know, you think about a special event, it's all designed to focus attention on whoever's being celebrated, whether it's a wedding, a bar mitzvah, it's a, a movie premiere, it's a gala. You're focusing on the charity, the people behind the scenes. They're not the story, right? Which is why Matt and I wanted to do the book. We wanted to tell that story. But the, the cool thing about a lot, so many of the people we worked in catering with is they're drawn to that because they love to perform, but they don't need to be thanked for it. And that's a really special, you know, we found there are a lot of really interesting, strong people we make parallels every now and then to like a military operation, you know, like special ops, but it's sort of, it's sort of like that. It's like you're sacrificing, you know, there's a sacrifice that goes along with it. You're, you know, you're doing your job, you're performing at the top level, you're putting in 150%. You're not expecting to be thanked for it. And that's for people like me and my brother who have egos and we're not great at performing. That's the other thing is that we were not, you know, we're not the best people to be caterers simply because we, we just don't have the skills. We were the low man on the totem pole. So from your opinion, is there more money to be made in a catering business versus a brick and mortar restaurant? I would say it's possible to make more money, but it's a difficult way to make money. It is a difficult way to make money. And every caterer I talked to said, whatever you do, don't make it look easy. <laughs> and I said, don't worry. <laughs> it's not, yeah. it's not even, rem it doesn't, nothing no. about this making. Yeah, and I read the book because, no, it's not. <laughs> because it, you know, you're adding to a food operation, a hauling operation. If you care about the quality of the food, you're always going to be at the mercy of whatever the contingency is. 
in the hauling operation and in the setup and the, you know, the compared to running an independent, your own independent restaurant where you granted there's plenty of the challenges to an independent restaurant. I don't want to create the impression that I'm saying it's easy. There are so many challenges to an independent restaurant, but at least you know your home, you know, the house is a known quantity every day, or that's the goal, right? You, you know, you know the people who inhabit it, you know who your servers are, you know, and in, in catering, it's different every day. It's a different staff. They might be working for another company tomorrow night and they're working for your company tonight. So there's so much trans transience in the catering business that I don't think that restaurateurs consider until they're forced to. I think more and more restaurateurs are getting experience doing that, doing off-premise catering because of festivals and, and, and just because people want their talents, you know, to move around, you know, they're doing pop-ups or, or special events, but you know, you have to know that it's a completely different beast. So anyhow, I'm, I'm really recommending, I mean, reading this book and if you want, uh, people wants to discover the secret oh, behind you. the scene uh, of catering. Thanks. It's a very easy read and um, there's a lot of uh, interesting stories <laughs> and a lot of laughing as well. Yes. It's great. It's, there's so, so there's so many laughs. The allergies <laughs> chapter. I mean, because if you <laughs> ask any caterer, like if you ask any caterer what's changed about your business in the last 10 years, the first thing they says is allergies and preferences. There's a chapter on design, you know, food design, because that's gone through the roof and become really interesting and avant-garde and really sort of changes the a party. And you can also listen to it. You know, the thing is that it's a fun book to listen to because my brother and I alternate chapters and we're kind of pretty different people. So, so it's kind of fun in that way too, to get the audio book. And it might be, you know, we're looking now to, um, there are some production companies that are interested in transforming it into a documentary, which would be amazing. Oh, nice. Because that, oh, wow. then it would just shine the light on the people who do this and how to tell the story in their own words. Oh, you know, that's great. So before we finish with a series of rapid fire questions, I'm re- looking at the time and we have been talking for a bit an hour already. <laughs> I always ask my guests, and I know that most of them are chefs or, you know, mixologists or pastry chefs, but you have written so many cookbooks and and I've seen something around that specific items. So I would like to pick your brain and what would you suggest uh, for a home cook how to create pimiento cheese, but, you know, with, with a twist, a Lee brother twist? I'm so glad you asked this because I had one at my friend Toby's house the other night that was amazing. And he used, you know, it, pimento cheese is usually typically an orange colored sharp cheddar cheese. He had used maybe a white cheddar really aged with some age on it, with some almost like crystalline structure. It was so delicious. But he'd also used poblano. He'd roasted poblano peppers and then pickled them. And it was just a completely different but familiar flavor. I mean, because I love roasted poblanos, right? It was like green chili. It was like a green chili pimento cheese and it was extraordinary. So that's, that's you know, there are so many ways to tweak pimento cheese and a lot of people do it with the ours has cream cheese and mayonnaise in it which is sort of controversial some people only you know think it's only mayonnaise but we like the combination there's so many different spins you can do on pimento cheese but that one with the extra sharp cheddar that was like really an aged cheddar had some real age on it and roasted pickled poblanos was extraordinary Okay, let's go for the rapid fire questions. So okay, the first I'm really one. Bad at this. <laughs> no, come on. You and I are going on a flavors unknown tasting trek in Charleston. So which are the five places that you are going to take me to? Okay. The first place I'm gonna take you is Dave's Carryout, which is we'll have to bring our own booze if we're gonna be imbibing because they don't have a liquor license, but you're gonna have a whole Fried flounder wow. with hop and john, which is a dish of rice and field peas and collard greens. And it's just going to, it's, it's 
going to be amazing. And you're, that's going to be your first impression of Charleston. And we're going to four more places. Then I'm going to take you to, I'm going to take you to a new place called Chubby Fish. And this is a chef who grew up in the South, spent some time in New York, is now back in South Carolina. And he's doing really interesting treatments using all sustainable, sustainable, sustainable fish. So you're going to have fish here that you've never had before. And it's all like the bycatch that an amazing fisherman brings in. And it's a really cool place. And it's all, you know, a lot of global influences. It's not going to, it's going to sort of destabilize your Charleston thing. Then we're going to go to Martha Lou's kitchen for the fried chicken the lima beans, and the mac and cheese. And that's going to be your like, you know, soul food nirvana. And we have two more places to yeah. go. And it could be a bar or it could be a food store. Or it could be, you know. Yeah. I would take you out to Bowen's Island because that's where you're going to have the oyster roast experience. This is like way out. It's out on Folly, near Folly Beach in the marsh. There's going to be oysters roasted open over an open fire. And fried fish and hush puppies and red rice and all that. It's going to be amazing. And then we're going to go. Where else are we going to go? We have one more place. We're going to go get a cocktail at the end of the night at the Dewberry, which is a fairly new establishment. Ryan Casey, who's an amazing mixologist, does beautiful cocktails there. And there, that's five. It's a challenge because here's the thing is that there's 50 more places I'd love to take you to in Charleston. It's a really exciting food community. It's very dynamic. There's new places opening all the time. There's, it's, you know, there's places sadly closing. There's places transforming themselves into different places. But it really is a dynamic food community. As I said at the beginning of the hour, we, are right on the coast and we have amazing fertile fields all around us. So we get the best vegetables and we get the best fish and shellfish. What's your favorite guilty pleasure food? Pork shoulder. Pork shoulder. Okay. Yep. And beyond pork shoulder, it's like just like totally junky junk food, like chips, tacos, Doritos. I'll, I'll eat a bag of that in 10 seconds. So besides your cookbooks, what are the three cookbooks that have most influenced you? Oh, that's a great question. I would say Edna Lewis's Taste of Country Cooking. That was like the classic of Southern, a woman telling the story of how she grew up through food. And the recipes are stellar and so pure and just simple. And the technique is so on point. So that's one. Another one is American cooking Southern style, which is from the Time Life series, the Foods of the World series. Eugene Walter did that one. And as far as like, that was a real inspiration f when we wrote our first book, because he went all over the South into people's homes and took pictures of them and how they cooked and just so much information, so much great material. And then The third, I would say, this one's going to come out of left field, but it's Evan Kleiman and Viana Laplace's La Cucina Fresca. You know, they're California chefs who wrote beautiful cookbooks about mostly Italian food. And this was like a simple, fresh, seasonal Italian cookbook that I took with me to grad school. And it just transformed the way I looked. You know, it wasn't a book from my world that I'd grown up in, but it made me see the, where I'd grown up and how I could translate that into the kitchen. So Evan Kleiman and Viana Laplace, she has a great, Evan Kleiman has a great radio show out of LA on KCRW. Okay. So the last one, what is your favorite food place besides Charleston, obviously? Oh, <laughs> that's a challenge. You know, I think it's the other place I know as well as Charleston, which is New York City. There's just so much here. You know, and there's just so much to, to learn. That's the thing that I think I love about both places, Charleston and, and New York, is that I'm constantly learning about a place that I 
feel like I know a lot about. And I think that's the thing. What is the latest place that you have discovered in uh, New York or Brooklyn? Oh, in Brooklyn, it's a place called Winsan. Oh, yes. W-I-N-S-O-N. Been there. Yes. You've been there? Right? Yeah, and I and so, I had the chef on my podcast if I interviewed him. So, really? yeah. Yeah, oh, that's it's awesome. Really, really cool. And they have the bakery on the other side of the, the street. Yeah, now, now they have so. the, the bakery just opened. Yeah. I've been there a yeah. few times, too. Yeah. It's so great. I yeah, just love is. that. My wife and I, we, we happen to live like five blocks away. So oh, okay. it's kind of become our local, but it feels so special too. Yeah. And the flavors you need to, have, just, you need to uh, have the eggplant dish, like one of the uh, uh, appetizer. This we, have, <laughs> we have a standing <laughs> order. So our, this is our order, Emmanuel. We do the pea shoots. Yes. The eggplant. Yes. The cucumbers. And then we usually get one other dish, which is either like the pork, the ground pork with noodles or maybe the shrimp or whatever. But that eggplant dish is extraordinary. It's fantastic, yeah. I like the fried chicken too, sandwich. It's really good. Anyhow, oh, yeah, the fried chicken. <laughs> we could talk about food the whole night. So thank yes. you so much for oh, thank you. Um, being a guest. And to everyone who is listening, they absolutely need to have... Southern Cookbook, Charleston Kitchen, Simple Fresh Southern, and now Hotbox in their book st- uh, shelves, for sure. This is great, great book. So thank you again, Ted. I really appreciate, you know, having you on, uh, on the podcast. Thank you, Emmanuel. It's been a pleasure. If you liked this episode with Ted Lee, please share it with a friend or with a colleague as I always welcome new listeners to the show. Again, the website for the podcast is flavorsunknown.com. Be sure to join me in two weeks as I am interviewing the award-winning bar director, Beau Dubois, who is based in San Diego and work at the restaurant Puesto. And we are going to talk about what it takes to revamp a cocktail program. And the last thing I want to say, as you might not have done it yet, have you subscribed to my podcast? So it is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, Overcast, CastBox, and any other phone podcast app. Wherever you are listening, please hit that button, subscribe as you don't want to miss another episode. I see you in two weeks. And until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. Thanks for listening to Flavors Unknown. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a review. Find the show notes at flavorsunknown.com. And if you want to join the Flavors Unknown community, search Flavors Unknown on Instagram and Twitter.